Hello and welcome and thanks for tuning in to our latest store tour of Zara's new flagship store in Madrid with our good friends at the a and Consumer and Retail Group. I'm your host, Chris Walton. And I'm Ann Mazinga. And we're the founders of OmniTalk, the fast-growing retail media outlet that is all about the companies, the technologies, and the people that are coming together to shape the future of retail, or as we like to say, the retail media organization that focuses on tomorrow today. As loyal OmniTalk fans likely know already, and you and I recently visited Zara's new flagship store in Madrid this past June, and we're blown away by the experience. Uh, yes, absolutely. We shot a video of how that store works. And I think I can safely say in our joint opinion, joint is opinion for sure, the best example of omnichannel apparel retailing that either of us has seen to date. Um, but I, I'm really excited to talk about this. Do you, are you are you at still like, does it still hold the does place? Does it still for rank you? that highly yes, for me? Yes, Anne? yes, yes. Yes, 100%. I couldn't agree more. 100%. I could not agree more. I think it's by bar none the best omni-channel apparel experience we've seen so far and to validate and or temper that assessment. And because, you know, sometimes we can get a little need that. hyperbolic and, yes. and get a little enthusiastic about our assessments. We're not going to lie. I but, don't know what you're talking about. Uh, headline of the year. <laughs> right, right, right. But for we have a special treat to keep us grounded. We have a special treat for you listeners today because we've invited two guests from the AM Consumer and Retail Group to join us and to give their expert consultative opinions on the experience. Yes, please join in welcoming in their debut on Amitak, June DeFabio and Joanna Rungarajan of the A&M CRG group to the show. June, Joanna, welcome to Omnitalk. How Thank are you doing you. today? Yes, absolutely. Um, we're excited to have you both. Um, before we get started, I'd love for you to each kind of tell the audience a little bit about each of you and your backgrounds and why uh, CRG picked both of you to discuss the innovation coming out of Zara today. Uh, Joanna, let's get started with you first. Give us a little background on you. Um, my background is, is mixed in both consulting and the industry. So I started my career in consulting um, specifically for retail. Oh. Um, so I developed a passion very early on for this for this space and haven't left um, since. In fact, I, I moved my career out of consulting and into the industry, um, more specifically, um, working in a few very large retailers, specifically in product development and sourcing oh. and operations. Um, and I did some work as well in the ESG and, and CSR sustainability space as well. And so I think in our conversation today, I'll certainly be championing some of that lens uh, as well. And then oh, I moved back over yes. to advisory. So okay. very excited um, to talk through this concept and more importantly, where, where it can take us in retail. Sounds, Excellent. Sounds like we got the right person. We do. With we do. Us. Um, June, let's hear a little bit about your background. I joined A&M CRG after um, over two decades of, of linear work in, um, in the industry in operating roles. So I was on the retail side for many years running merchandising, planning, operations, private brand, product development, that, that sort of thing. And then on the wholesale and brand side of the industry in large lifestyle brands, okay. running sales and operations. We have the perfect dynamic I think we, duo. I, I think we do. We have two people that definitely know more about apparel retailing than, than I do, yes, for, sure. for sure. I don't want to speak for you, but that's definitely no, the case absolutely, for me. Absolutely, without a doubt. Uh, Temper our expectations <laughs> right. is the right thing. Right. Or fan the flames, Ann. Fan the flames yeah, if you true, want to, you true, know, but true, we'll see true. where this goes. We have no idea where this is going to go for those listening. But <laughs> in order to, to put this together, we've got, we're going to have a little fun today. So here's how this segment, this interview with these folks from a &M CRG is going to work. First, we're going to replay the video and the audio we recorded during our visit to Zara in June. Yes. Then, Anne, and this is my favorite part, Anne and I are going to pretend we are the co-CEOs of a multi-billion dollar specialty apparel retailer called, wait for it, m and W. See what I, I did don't there? I get it. Bazanga and Walton. <laughs> oh, like m and S, Marks and Spencer's, but oh, Bazanga and Walton. Oh, got it. Got oh, okay. Now, it. Clever. Okay, okay. Good. All right. Yeah. Yes. And as CEOs, we want your expert opinions, Juno and Joanna, after watching the video together of what we should take away from the Zara experience. What should we be excited about? What should we maybe not be so excited about? All right. Should we roll to the video? Let's do it, Anne. All right. Let's do it. Buenos dias. This is Omnitalk Retail coming to you live from Madrid, Spain. I'm Ann Mazinga. And I'm Chris Walton. And we're standing outside of Zara's flagship store. That's right, Ann. We are in Madrid 
and we're going to show you guys an inside look at what is quite honestly the most advanced omni-channel retail apparel experience that we have seen to date and here is exactly why first off the store is massive totaling approximately 82,000 square feet and covering four floors in total with a back of house that is designed into the operations of the building as you'll see it features men's women's kids lingerie beauty and much much more as soon as we enter the store you can tell there is just something different about it there's a placard on the wall with a QR code asking patrons to discover what the store is all about. The store offers a wide array of interesting and new omnichannel experiences. The first is what Zara is calling pay and go, which Chris is demonstrating here. He simply scans the products he wants to buy, pays for them electronically, and then visits a station to remove the security tags and just walks out the door. Second is the ability to reserve a fitting room, all of which can be handled right from the app as seen here. Once customers arrive at the fitting room, their room is waiting for them. And if they didn't pre-reserve a room, they're able to hold all of their products up to a screen and an RFID sensor will determine how many products the customer has to try on and assigns the next available fitting room. Last but not least, is the ability to schedule an order pickup from a parcel robot that is integrated right into the wall. This is a great omnichannel addition to the experience. It saves time and money for Zara's customers and for Zara. It also incents impulse purchases from customers who want to come in and pick up an order. The way Zara has designed the parcel robot deserves some special call out too. The robot was custom designed for Zara by Cleveron. It has one center console from which all parcels go in and out. It stores items on trays as opposed to lockers and sets aside just as much space as needed for a specific parcel, which allows Zara to optimize storage space within the robot and fit as many parcels inside it as possible. There's even a sustainability angle. A parcel slot next to the robot encourages customers to take packages out of the boxes and bags they were received in and recycle them all of which has the added benefit of the customer likely returning anything they're unhappy with right then and there, as opposed to taking the entire parcel home and then shipping it back at a later date. Okay, Chris, I have to see what you thought of it because I was blown away. I thought it was fantastic. Like the things that I loved most about it, Anne, I love the pay and go feature. That oh, was cool. so simple and easy to use. And then I also love the parcel robot. That thing was slick. And the best thing I can say about both those things together is it gave me the same great Zara experience that I've come to know and love, but it gave it to me on my schedule. It was super convenient. And the best way I can sum that up is I never have to wait in the dreaded apparel cash wrap line ever again. Oh my gosh, I completely agree. That parcel robot was a dream. And I couldn't believe how many people were using it. We could barely get, we could a, get a shot of the video. Yeah, yeah, we could barely get a shot. People young, old. I have to say, Chris, this Zara store absolutely lived up to the hype, including yeah. my favorite part. The fitting room oh right no about. trying things on in a mirror in the middle of the store and you just booked it right in the app i got up there before i even got up to the room my room was ready for me and i was able to try things on and get right out of there that was pretty slick pretty slick well said my friend well said and for all you out there this has been omni talk retail providing you yet again another glimpse into where the future of retail is headed all right, and watching that back with with Joanna and June, I mean, gosh, we were fanboying and fangirling that thing oh, pretty yeah. hard. Yes. Like it's pretty funny. Yes, I mean, it did help that we got to go to Madrid to see that live. Like being in the real environment also like encouraged that experience for us to be yeah. so much better. Even though it was like a hundred degrees that day, too, it was so hot. Yeah, <laughs> it, didn't it didn't it didn't temper my opinion of it whatsoever. No, not at all. Um, well, right off the bat, the first thing that caught our eye was Zara's pay and go experience. So I, June, I want to go to you first. What's your take on this? If you're advising, uh, M and W retail CEOs I love here, it. uh, what, what are you telling us about the, the scan and go? Well, I just think it's brilliant. Um, okay. you do. Any, All right. Any kind of innovation that can take friction out of the consumer experience is, um, is highly advisable. And the fact that as consumers, we've become habitualized to pay and go 
with high frequency visits to, you know, grocery store, the drug sector, even, mm -hmm. even the home improvement sector. I think most consumers in a store environment feel, feel very comfortable with it. And it is way beyond time for this sort of innovation to come to apparel retailing. Take away that entire, I love you said it perfectly, Chris, the dreaded apparel cash wrap line. Yes. Absolutely make it easy. June, I'm curious, like from an operational standpoint and with your background, like what are some things that you would advise us to consider that you think other retailers listening should be, should consider, you know, as they roll this out, knowing that their, their customers are, are craving it and are having those experiences in other retail stores. I think the difference here is scanning the QR code and actually going into the Zara app mm -hmm. in order to do your, your scan and go transaction. And so that is going to have some, some ramp up, um, as, as people start to get comfortable with it. Um, not, not unlike a, a scan and go at a grocery store, you know, circa four years ago, um, okay. when, when there was, there was still a lot of self-education and, mm -hmm. and the stores had to offer the type of, uh, ride along tutorial that that got people more comfortable and more habitualized but um but the added benefit of that is that then your customer has your app yes right and they've become engaged with you not just in that one moment but far beyond that because they're they're going to carry that that with them and um and they're not frequenting an apparel fashion retail store the same way as as they would in in the drugstore sector or the grocery store sector. So this is a way for them to to take that experience, you know, on the road. Yeah, June, you know that's interesting. The the analogy with the self checkout machine at the grocery store, I think, is really interesting because one of the questions that we have, you know, in in visiting the store and and have for you now that you've said that too is you know, it basically requires a new, and the way they've designed it, it requires a new piece of hardware that you have to acclimate the customer to. Would, would either of you be concerned with that as a, as an apparel operator to have to put that in your store? Like how should retailers be thinking about that type of deployment in terms of what you saw here? So Chris, you're talking about um, the tag removal. Yeah. The tag and removal and then the separate place in the store, the separate like checkout kiosk in the store for this mm -hmm. aside from the cash wrap, as you're trying to get customers acclimated, it's kind of like the airlines actually, when you think about it back in the day, in terms of getting mm -hmm. them acclimated to standing in line versus the kiosk, it's almost one in the same mm -hmm. thing that you're trying to do. How would you think about that? Because you know, capital from a capital standpoint, that's going to require money to go in and renovate the stores and put this type of technology in. How would you advise people to think about that? Well, I, I think there's a conversion aspect to that, right? Um, mm -hmm. You you see plenty of apparel retailers who have who have taken away the big bar already, and mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that cash wrap, even though it's serviced by an associate today, is um, is is pretty freestanding, right? And you know most most grocery and, and drug and, and even the home improvement sector have just converted mm -hmm. what that existing equipment is and made it self-service friendly. Make it, make it a multi-use cash wrapper point of sale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Joanne, I'm curious too, like uh, from your perspective too, especially given your background on sourcing, like the, the tagging part, you know, is a potential point of friction that I think you or the detagging part is a potential point of friction that we have to think about. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you, you watching it, you saw anything else that you could take away in terms of maybe how to do it differently or, um, you know, also how did, how should retailers be thinking about the theft side of this too? Cause that's always what comes up with these mm -hmm. scan and go solutions. How would you advise, uh, retailers on that side of things, Joanna, maybe you, why don't you take this one? Yeah, absolutely. I think a couple of things. Um, the first, first of all, in terms of implementation, since you you brought that up a second ago, how can we kind of convert the retail experience? And I think there are different ways to do that. I think June, what you were describing is is absolutely right in sort of repurposing or designating mm -hmm. an area of an existing cash wrap. It already has tag removal capability. Mm -hmm. You kind of have a designated lane. But prior to that, even as you're trying to potentially create some type of retrofit minorly in a store, you can start to acclimate the consumer using 
already some of the handheld technology that we see in stores today, right? Where um, a store associate may be able to help me purchase online and ship something that they don't have my size, they can do the pay and go for me, right? As I start to get used to how to do it. So mm -hmm. from an acclimation of a customer mm -hmm. and how to roll it out, I think there's a way to sort of get people involved and educated just through osmosis. And then That's the empowerment mm -hmm. comes afterwards. Now, more specifically on your question around shrink and theft and how to think about that, I do think self um, removal of security tags is, is a challenge retailers need to watch out for, for the consumer. Mm -hmm. Having been a store associate long ago, um, yeah. removing that tag is very delicate, right? So I think what retailers have to think about is where's the placement of that security tag so that the damage risk to the item itself is minimal. So where they're choosing to put that, but also how do they kind of start to get away from those big old school tags and start to think about more, uh, you know, smaller integrated tags that could be in something like a price ticket, which is already catching your door scanners for a shrink perspective and a consumer could remove that at, at checkout. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Chris, in terms of things they could contemplate. Um, but I think it's funny when you mentioned uh, theft, I thought immediately of my first experience in an Amazon Go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How right. I felt like, you know, and there were so many stories about feeling like that. And so I also think coupling the concept of pay and go with what we saw at the fitting room, and we can talk about this a little later with RFID, mm -hmm. I think can also mm -hmm. help bridge some of that together. And, that was going to be actually, that was going to be exactly what I was going to ask you next is like the key point of this too, that can't be left out of the conversation is RFID is very deployed within this operation. Right. Absolutely. And so there's angles to that from a theft prevention perspective that could yep. be in play here. It's hard for us to tell in terms of how we shot the video and what we're able to see from the store, but let's, let's go there next because yep. the, the use of RFID is quite palpable, particularly in the fitting rooms mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and love them or hate them. Fitting rooms seem to be a fact of life at this point. Uh, there are many things RS doing there from using RFID to track the number of garments you're bringing with you, you're taking in and out of the fitting room, which I think mm -hmm. is probably pretty valuable data. And then I know the part, Anne, you love yes. mobile online fitting room reservations. Yes. Uh, so like lots to, lots to unpack there, literally. Yeah. Um, so how do you join How do you sort through those options? Like, what did you like? What did you not like? What should M and W take away from yes. your, your experience? M and W. Well, as you're starting your, your retail journey, I think what you take away is, is the opportunity for real integrated shopping. Um, I loved it watching that, um, and seeing how as you approach the fitting room and the number of RFID scanners that must be deployed throughout that yes. store, right? They know not just when I pass that fitting room, how many items, but they know which ones I have. Mm -hmm. So the concept of bringing that into the app on my phone where I can start to get some of the service, high touch concierge service, that gets me really excited in terms of where this can go. Could it make a recommendation of pairs well with, may mm -hmm. I suggest, styling recommendations, allowing for additional item pickups, but also when I'm in the fitting room, if I needed to do a size swap or a color swap, the concept of requesting that through that technology is where I really got excited. And I got a little less excited over the reservation of the fitting room itself, Okay, um, but I, it's cool. I just, it, that was less compelling for me than some of the other elements of where that technology could go. Well, and I think that's a good thing to point out too, Joanna. Like the reason that this was compelling to me is that as an avid Zara shopper- You are an avid Zara shopper. Waiting in line, which you're typically yeah. like, yeah. I think that's the part of it that that makes sense. And and again, to to the point of, of consulting more broadly to retailers across the board for this type of thing, like that if you don't have a problem with, tr you know, fitting room line, as it yes. stands right now, like not as much of a, of an issue or a value to your consumer, but from a Zara perspective, H and M, like these fast fashion, yes. in, like all these places that are, that you need to try things on because the, you know, for various reasons, the return <laughs> policies are not great or mm -hmm. you know, one thing or another, or there's a line to return something. Like, I think that's where the real power comes in from yeah. the, the booking, the pre-booking of the mm -hmm. fitting room, knowing yes. you don't have to wait there. And I think you're absolutely right in terms of there's a model, there's a mm -hmm. place for that, mm -hmm. for sure. I think when I think more broadly about retail um, application, 
that particular piece may be less so, but I still have the opportunity to engage in what I'm trying on, yeah. how I can can um, pair that, what else I can do with the technology that surrounds the ability to reserve, and then most importantly, connect that to my pay and go. Like all, right. to, you know, kind of moves yeah. back to this idea of a more seamless experience that we can kind of see on the horizon. Well, I got to think too, just knowing knowing what's going into the fitting room yes. and not getting purchased is probably a good leading indicator of what you need to take to mark down more quickly yes. than you probably otherwise would know it. Right. Am I thinking about that the right way? A, a thousand percent in June. I'm sure you're ready to, you know, you want to talk through <laughs> yeah, that. June, but I please. Can just say yes, absolutely. The idea of having that sooner than you're mm -hmm. reading your daily sales, mm -hmm. even right. There's That's the first indicator, but by all means, June share. Exactly. There's, um, been such a ramp up on, on spending in the store management technology sector uh, specifically this year. And, and I think it's because people are back out there again. And, um, and there's, there's just, you know, such a demand to enable your frontline workers with, with more technology assistance. And a big piece of that is, is, AI and machine learning that can come from what is your customer really interacting with and how are they making decisions. And uh, I love the idea that Joanna has about being in the fitting room with three or four items and the, the system knows what you've got. And, you know, some of that may be as simple as a size swap for something yep. that you already have, but the, um, the additional on may we suggest to have that come out and sort of surprise and delight you in the mm -hmm. fitting room because they've, they've really enabled the, um, the service level there in a way that you're familiar with on right. e-com, you know, you're getting, you're getting may we suggest across the bottom of your screen, but, but now here it is in real time. And, um, and that's, that's something that, that should really push high on, on basket size and, and order multiples. Well, yeah, that, 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 that last point was going to be what I was going to add too, is like, it's gotta be a marketer's return on ad spend dream too, because mm -hmm. you've got this, let's not forget the scan and go pay and go is a portion of this, which mm -hmm. you guys said gets you into the mobile app. Now I know what's going into the fitting room and yes. coming out or not coming out. And then I can retarget my ads with much better efficiency in theory using the best and latest, greatest tactics around data. That makes a ton of sense ultimately at the end of the day. Well, it right. provides a, an amount of um, you know, advice and counsel for your, your physical labor sitting at the fitting room all of a sudden becomes a brilliant stylist, right? <laughs> Well, and, 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 um, most, and yeah, most importantly, June, they, they also know what they have in the store to sell you. I mean, I think exactly. that's a key component. Like yeah. your, your stylist is only as good as, you know, what, what they can bring to the room or to Joanna's earlier point, you know, what they can pull up on their own devices and say, I don't have it, but I'll order it for you right now. I mean, without the visibility to what you have on the floor or in your warehouses, like great none of too. this is possible. Makes the fitting room experience that much better. Right. Yeah. Joanna, what were we going to say? For sure. I was just going, going back, Chris, to your point about, you know, wouldn't we love to see what people are interacting with and, and putting down? And I think about how, you know, pulling that forward into your process before you're dealing with a customer reason for return, right? When right. you're seeing, you know, how many items, and again, it doesn't even have to make it to the fitting room. I think that piece may tell us about fit, fit consistency, you know, some, some other elements of data that are huge as we think about our specs um, uh -huh. for the actual product fit itself. But even more importantly, if I'm uh, walking through my store experience and I've already engaged an item and then that item doesn't make it out with me, there's, you know, that is a data point, regardless of whether I tried it on. Something mm -hmm. about it changed my mind. I can only envision where this continues to go, where it does ask me, why mm -hmm. was that? 
what was it? Just like in a return, was it the price? Was it the color? Was it the hand feel of the fabric? Right. And so trying as much as possible to collect that information yeah. to both give me a personalized shopping experience, but to also to your markdown point, start to inform much quicker. What inventory is just not productive for me? And how do I quickly move past that and amplify the inventory that is? Yeah, you're right. And some sample size of the population is going to help you with that information qualitatively. Exactly. Most likely. Or you can incent them to do it right as well. Absolutely. Well, I want to go to one uh, last point that I, I really loved about this, especially because we were able to do this not only in the U.S. Yeah. before we got to Spain, but also in Spain in a matter of minutes um, was the on automated online order pickup. Um, there were so many people using this of all ages, yeah. all demographics, um, were using the parcel robot in store to pick up their packages. Um, Joanna, we absolutely love this idea. We want to be smart though, about how we think about it and the right use case for this. Um, what considerations should we as M and W or the retailers <laughs> listening be considering when we're just making a decision about how to facilitate um, that online order pickup so seamlessly? So I think your word seamless is right. It, it did make a seamless experience, but why was that? You mm -hmm. know, the robot itself was compelling. And I do believe back to our point earlier about there's a time and a place for some of this functionality. I think in retailers who have very predictable inventory and inventory size, you know, I think more about beauty or cosmetics, for example, that may be a bit more applicable when I then when I transfer that to something that has large bulky puffer winter jackets mixed with very slim trousers or tank mm. tops, right? So mm. the size of the tray or the locker, um, which I know, I know this system uses, uh, uses trays, but I think that um, it's more applicable for retailers that have inventory that is more specific, you know, size, more standardized products, more sets, standardized products. Yeah. And, um, but what I did love about it and was that the, the pickup was seamless. It was ready for me when I expected. I think mm -hmm. Bopus has hit some bumps where it's not quite ready when I expected it to be there and I couldn't get it. And so I think that's what made that experience actually, you know, more um, positive for the consumer. But lastly, as I looked at it, I really thought about it from a financial perspective in terms of the implementation of a system like that and what what is the the labor that's actually behind it because mm -hmm. while the robot was delivering the final parcel mm -hmm. the the pick the pack and the um distribution of that parcel to the tray was being done by store labor mm -hmm. so really where is my trade-off here um in, in order to get the return on my investment for that right and what is the like from the consumer standpoint it's amazing you're again like back to the the crux of an an issue big issue with zara it being the lines being a problem exactly uh, you know right. like you're eliminating that friction point for the consumer but i think it's important to think about the operations behind the scenes too like you're talking about joanna of right. what is the you also said there, there was a long line at it yeah you, you had a hard time getting a shot of it right so there's still a queue yeah, there was, there still was a queue. It was small though. Cause it was quick. Like the yeah. video happened that fast for us. It was yeah. more just like shooting a video where people wanted to give us the time <laughs> to shoot it, you know, but, but overall it was pretty like, quick. I have something to pick up. Yeah. Yes. Right. Today. Yeah. Right. But Anne's point's right. Like it eliminates the, it definitely eliminates the line of having to stand, but also from Zara's point of view, it eliminates them having to staff the order yes. pickup station with one or more people. And in the high volume location, you could actually see how a Especially retail would have to staff, you know, multiple people in that location as well. Um, it, it does require, you know, a store associate to leave the floor to go retrieve that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you do have a store labor save in that respect, but you're still having to pull the order and still yeah. assemble yep. it. So right. you're still, you still have that. Yep. I do think there's um, some we can learn from other industries where you see almost a self-service without the robotics on a BOPIS type of scenario. When you think about whether that's pickup in food um, or in grocery, there are some other ways that it can be done maybe with a little less capital. 
but there are certainly cases to be made for for what we saw there. Right. So what you're saying there is the idea and principle is good. And it's just about how you execute it. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be built into the side of the building. This was a new build. So Zara had the ability to do that. But if you're an average retailer in the mall, you might take a different approach to accomplish the same thing. Joanna, is that kind of where your head is? Or June, is that where your head is? You know, we we are big fans of robotics and using robotic innovation obviously has been something that that we've implemented inside distribution centers mm-hmm. and pick pack, whether that's individual e-com orders or or large wholesale containers and and had extraordinary success with that because the labor efficiency is is amazing and the um, the capital expenditure pays for itself very quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, when you think about that in a consumer facing way, you need to start thinking carefully about when it will scale and what that ROI looks like. And I was Mm -hmm. so impressed last week, you covered the Walgreens um, pick pack on pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, having a centralized location to to use robotics and pick pack and RX and have that available. Number one, it improves the consumer experience and and there's a quality control um, factor to that, which which is superior, and at the same time creates a lot of labor efficiency. So so that's the type of category where I think it makes a lot of sense and is quickly scalable and would be part of a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and then, you know, thinking through it in fashion retail is, is probably a flagship proposition as, as customers start to, to use BOPUS more and more. Right. But if I read the if I read the tea leaves of what you guys are saying, you're you're also saying, you know, by default then that kind of the next frontier of this, particularly if you look at it from Zara's point of view, is probably to look at how do you eliminate the picking and packing costs through automation mm-hmm. somehow mm-hmm. at the larger locations first, using the greatest latest and greatest in innovations in robotics. Like I, and this is essentially why Walmart acquired alert innovation for that mm-hmm. reason, right? Yeah, to help right. with this at the micro fulfillment level. Um so that's interesting. It's interesting to hear. Yeah, that's an important point of this. There's how you pick and pack, and then how you deliver. Mm-hmm. But net net, there's a lot to be learned here from the delivery of the goods from a frictionless consumer experience standpoint. Okay, awesome. All right, well, looking back at everything, we have to put you guys on the spot because you guys are famous for doing that to us each and every week on our weekly <laughs> Fast Five podcast. So June, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you on this one. So if there was one, in it, we're gonna come to both of you, but I'm gonna, June, I'm gonna go to you first. If there was one innovation that you saw here today. What would you recommend specialty apparel retailers take and start thinking about for their business? Pay and go. Pay and yeah, go? For sure. And, um, and making sure that on the returns side, it is equally as, as simple. Huge, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So pay and go or bring back and get a credit. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is what you said you wanted to see more of, right? And yeah. in the store, that yeah. was kind of your big, like, I wish I, I wish this was better if this happened. Yes. Right? Or yeah. I, I thought I could, this could be better yep. if this happened. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Making that returns process more seamless. It, I mean, a lot of what we're hearing about in the news, uh, you know, to, to go back to some of the fast fives we've been covering too, is like, how do you make it as simple as scanning the QR code and handing off a package and leaving right. or dropping it in a kiosk? versus or putting in a parcel mm-hmm. robot or something. Right. 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 Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Joanna, how about you? What was your, and, what was your, and, Oh, June, sorry. sorry you, to say? you know, the, the investment pays back almost immediately, you know, as a customer acquisition cost, right? It's, it's the least expensive customer acquisition cost you will ever have <laughs> if you're a fashion apparel retailer. And all of a sudden you have a new consumer who's first party data engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You get first party data through that Mm -hmm. engagement of their in-store shopping experience too, which is an important thing because that doesn't exist Mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, Mm -hmm. Joanna, same, would you say the same thing or would you add any other angles here? Like, how do you think about that question? So I, 
you know, boring here. I'm echoing what June said. And, and the first party data was actually one of the things that got me most excited as well. But um, to kind of build and, and in the spirit of, of adding another angle, I do think the investment in whether it's RFID or QR code technology more broadly is something that retailers really can capitalize mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, I realize there is sort of a scanning investment on the RFID, but we, good news, we've been dealing with RFID now for a number of years. And so the prepare, the preparation, the scalability of it, the ease to set up um, has, has dramatically reduced, but the, the possibilities really do open up for engaging with your customer in a different way and also telling your own story. And so, you know, again, putting on sort of a sourcing ESG lens for a moment, being able to also talk to your consumer about the traceability of the product, the attributes behind um, the fabrications or the methods used to manufacture or um, the social uh, justice that was incorporated into the men and women who created the garment. You can tell a lot of those stories as well um, through that engagement. So I'm with June on pay and go. I'm I'm wholeheartedly into the customer acquisition, but I think you know I'll make a big case for for RFID technology. Yeah, I, I want to ask you then too. I've got you. Last question here, really. Like, so Joanna, like at this point, should any retailer be dragging their feet on RFID? I mean, or is it just a given? At this point, or like, does it matter depending on what type of retailer you are, what type of business you run? Help us understand that because that's a big question yeah. that, that Ann and I have always had about mm -hmm. why does this still seem like it's not taking hold as fully or as palpably as it is at, say, this Zara store? So I think it's a few reasons. I think that to answer explicitly, you know, should people be pursuing this? I think yes. I think because the possibilities of where it can take you depends on, on who you are from a retailer perspective and what your objectives are and whether you take it from a marketing or a merchandising mm -hmm. and a promo um, cadence that you mentioned, Chris, before, um, or into more of the styling and the recommendations um, for your customers. I mean, I think, I think that's up to your brand ethos um, and what your mission is. But I think the reason people have struggled is because first and foremost, it came out as a technology. And I think right. the idea of it being, um, you know, maybe more for warehouses and understanding mm -hmm. inventory mm -hmm. location mm -hmm. through that lens, mm -hmm. as opposed to the power of, and Anne, I think you said it earlier, knowing what inventory I have around me, knowing yes. what is mm -hmm. happening to that inventory. I think we're now starting to author the story of where this can go. Um, and I, but I do believe that it came out as sort of an IT thing yeah, yeah. and has now taken on. Also, the RFID tags themselves have really advanced. They used right. to be quite right. large and unwieldy and, and stickered almost. And now they're you know pretty small, pretty slick, can be sewn in. Um, the cost of them has also come down you know, from a sourcing perspective. They're much less expensive per garment than they used to be. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of in the mid single uh, single digit cents per garment and that includes uh, assembly onto the product so i think i think those things are helping push people over the edge but i think we really have to challenge ourselves on where where the power of it can go and how we can really harness it because it's technology that already exists mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. how do we use that and maximize as opposed to introducing brand new and starting all over yeah june you're a former you know specialty coo like how do you what do you think on that question? What do you, what would you add to what Joanna just said? Well, when we first started rolling out RFID and, and the reason that some were early adopters and, and some were dragging their feet, it was because exactly as Joanna said, it was seen as an inventory play. Right. So it was sort of a, a single dimensional use case and it was pretty expensive. And, you know, the added, you know, downside was that it was kind of clunky. Mm -hmm. But, um, but now you've got this whole host of multi-dimensional ways in which you can use the data that you collect from RFID. And, um, and so, you know, the fact that you can tie those things into an in-store technology that actually informs your frontline worker and enables your frontline worker with more intel, like right there on the spot, that's incredibly evolved yeah. for, for something that 
basically the functionality of the RFID tag, even though it's a lot slimmer and less expensive, it really hasn't changed in 10 years. No. Right. Yeah. No. But, We're just figuring um, out all the value options right. from exactly. it. Exactly. We, yeah. we have imagined all the new ways that you can use it. And so now it, it has multi-dimensional use case and, and is an extraordinarily productive investment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so net, net, Anne, I think, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Joanna and June, but I think you kind of agree. This is a pretty cool experience. <laughs> this is a Zara stores. This, they're doing some pretty good things here, huh? Definitely. They're doing, they are creating a completely unique experience for sure. And, and I think they're pushing, they're pushing the boundaries on, you know, what brick and mortar really looks like from a store experience. And most importantly, back to our beginning conversation around sort of that frictionless experience that, that really welcomes me back to brick and mortar. Right. Um, right. Great point. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I am so comfortable with digital and so comfortable with my phone, but I still, I still do love a retail experience and it's giving me a reason to, to go back. Yeah. I love that. Um, Joanna, June, thank you both so much for diving into this experience with us, for giving us all your expertise for the it's recommendations. I think Chris and I now at uh, M and W, yeah. we know what we're going to, what the right investments are for us as a, as an apparel retailer. Um, if people <laughs> are listening to this, they would like to have their own session with a and CRG to go through and analyze all of the cool technologies that are, are out in the space right now. Um, what's the best way for them to reach out to, to a and um, Joanna, you want to give us, give us some contact info? Absolutely. You can find both June and me and, um, and our other wonderful colleagues at CRG at our website, um, which is Alvarez and Marcel hyphen CRG, uh, dot com. And then June and I are both, uh, findable on LinkedIn. All right. Excellent. Awesome. That was a ton of fun. Thank you guys Thank both. You. For doing, Thank you both for doing that. Uh, absolutely. Thank blast. you guys. Yeah. Invite us a, to Madrid next time. Yes. Yes. yes we'll right? try. We'll try. <laughs> yes. We'll let, we'll let the folks at A&M CRG know that, that that's, that's coming next. Uh, yeah. Love to have you guys. That'd be great. Uh, well, again, thanks to June, to Fabio and Joanna run garage for sitting down with us today. And as always to everyone listening out there on behalf of everyone at Omni talk, be careful out there. <laughs>